So today we will be doing movie recommendation. I was surprised to see that many of you have already watched most of the movies which I had given. The second thing we will do today is, this is the quiz for you, I mean not the literal quiz. What do you see? Or is it just random? Sorry? Top view of a forest, okay. More guesses? Um, I, I don't need the justification, just the answers. <clears throat> okay, last row. Noise, who says noise? Okay, last row. Middle column, last row, anyone? Okay, the middle of the middle. The person in the green. Yeah, person in the green. Yes. Oh, any guesses? I'm not marking you. What do you think this means? You have to be louder. Noise? Okay. Someone in the second row here. Okay. Parag. Parag, right? Guesses? Okay. So, <clears throat> and you'll have to see how this is going to be linked with movie recommendation. At the end of the lecture, we'll be starting off with something like this and creating this image. Right? So this person, or I mean not this, this entity was a dog. Now you can, perhaps having seen the answer, you can see some of the shapes, some of the edges. But we'll have a computer do this for you. Start off with this image and create this image. So let's go back to movie recommendation. So this is a spreadsheet that I'd obtained. And it's updated as of 8.37 AM. But I took the cutoff at around 8.30. So those who filled in late, unfortunately, we won't be able to recommend any movies to you. So this, there was an interesting competition known as the Netflix challenge. Has anyone heard of Netflix challenge? So this was in the older days. This was, I mean, so Netflix, as we know, as it exists now, didn't exist in, like, existed in a different form earlier. Does anyone know how? So currently it's a streaming service, like Amazon Prime, like Disney, like Hulu, and all of the others. How did Netflix exist earlier before this? Rentals, right? So you would actually, they would ship the movies to you, and you would request for it. So they had this challenge called Netflix challenge, Netflix prize. They had 1004805070 ratings. So in our case, we have about 110 users who filled up the form and about seven movies, so something less than 700. They had about 500,000 users and about 18,000 movies. So their goal was to recommend which movie to watch. Right. Let's see if they mention the year or so. It says the competition began on October 2006, and they mentioned just the prizes. So if we go back to the spreadsheet, does anyone want to volunteer to say which movie we should recommend to them? If not, I'll randomly pick up. OK, so let's randomly pause here. Do we have Teerth here? OK, Teerth. So Teerth hasn't watched Shole, hasn't watched Swadesh, has watched Matrix, Interstellar, Dangal, Tara Zameen Par, hasn't watched Notting Hill and has watched Uri. So, would you recommend him to watch Shole and Swadesh or no? Or when would you recommend him to watch something? You'd watch, you recommend him to watch something if the predicted rating for that particular movie is high, right? So, that is typically what you'd imagine being done that if you're likely to have rated a movie high, you would have watched it, right? 
but sometimes they, the company also does uh, variation around this. They don't always want to show you movies you might rate highly. They also introduce something, an element of diversity. So that some movies which you may have not liked, they'll also give you that. So then our task begins that we'll be starting off with a matrix which looks like this, where we have some users and we have some movies and we have these question marks to indicate that this person has not watched this movie. We don't know the rating for this person for this movie. We have n users, m movies, and our task is to predict these unknown ratings for the movies. <coughs> to answer this, we'll <coughs> consider a subset of the users and movies, which is something I've created just for illustration purposes. As of now, I've assumed complete data. So complete data means that there is no missing entry here, which is not what we wanted to do. We want to fill in the missing ratings, ratings but for simplicity, we'll start off with this setting that, the, that we have for all the users, we have for all the movies, we have the ratings. Now, what can you say about user one by looking at their ratings for this movie? What do you think user one likes or what is some characteristic you can pick for user one. Likes Bollywood or Hindi or Indian movies, right? Good. And dislikes Hollywood. It not just likes Bollywood, but dislikes Hollywood. Like we're just making some guesses, may or may not be correct. What about user two? Sorry? Science fiction. So this is not really a science fiction. But it, there is an element of science in it. Good. What else can someone think? Nolan movies, right? So they like Christopher Nolan movies, which is good. But they also like Swadesh. And I should have probably kept Shawshank to 3.5 or not 3. So I'm trying to point out to something. All of them have some engineering involved, right? Like Batman creates very cool engineering solutions for, for Saving the world, interstellar, of course, is space time travel. Shawshank Redemption, I forgot that there was an element of engineering, but very crude form of engineering where the person escapes the prison. And so this, of course, they created a hydroelectric power plant, not a power plant, but generated electricity. Shole probably doesn't have any of those elements, right? So perhaps this person likes some amount of engineering. Again, I'm completely making this up. What about U3? This is the most challenging one. U3 gives poor ratings to almost all of the movies except for Shawshank. Guesses. So in interviews, you have to give some informed guesses. Think of this as an interview. OK, first column, OK. They have a preference for the actors. OK, they have picked up a very specific actor who acted in Shawshank, and that actor was not repeated in other movies. OK, that could be one plausible, uh, one plausible explanation. What else? So all of the first, so the first two movies, they are very, very long three hours and so, something like that. The next two are slightly shorter in duration, but still long, and Shawshank was the shortest one. So let's say this person just likes shorter movies. Right? So I again, completely made this up. And while I was creating this example, I realized that the, there were some problems in the survey on the questions that I'd given you. Can anyone point out what? So one I pointed out that majority of the movies were slightly longer, like if you look at Shole, Swadesh, Matrix, Interstellar, Dangal, Taris, I mean, but many of them were longish movies. So I haven't given you a full spread across the length of the movie. What else is the problem in the survey that I gave you? Have you heard of all of these movies? M main, uh, like mostly all of you have heard of many of these movies, even if you have not watched, right? So there is a bias in that respect, except for something like Notting Hill, which I thought that many, like, not a lot of you have watched. But the others, 
it seems many of you have watched or heard of these movies. What is the other source of bias which exists? Which inherently came in while I was creating this survey. You expect them to be? Good movies, okay. Yeah. So it's not we expect them to be, they are all rated highly by reviewers, critics, IMDB, right? So I completely missed on this point. I should have added some poorly rated movies also to get a full range across the different kinds of movies, except for, I think, probably Notting Hill, except for Notting Hill, many of them are eight and above on IMDB. So you can also check them if you want to, like say. So IMDB, let's say, so Uri seems to be 8.2, and Tar is a mean per, it's not written as Tar is a mean per, what is it written as, does anyone know? Stars on the floor, something. Tare, yeah, like stars on earth, so they have given it a little English translation. This is also 8.3, so many of them turn out to be very highly rated on IMDB and similar portals. This was one bias which I created. You should try and avoid such biases when you collect data for your machine learning experiments because this will not give you very good results on different kinds of movies. Okay, let's come back. So we have seen that user one liked Bollywood, dislikes Hollywood. User two likes some element of engineering and user three likes shorter movies. So what we're saying is that each of the movie, we'll try and characterize using three features as of now. The first being the Bollywoodness, the second being engineering, this third being length. I've again arbitrarily created these just for the purposes of illustration. These have no physical meaning as such. Shole has very high Bollywoodness, like it's a <coughs> classic Bollywood kind of movie. So there's Batman and Interstellar Shawshank have lesser of Bollywoodness. Shole has no very low amount of engineering. It has Swades, Batman, Interstellar, Shawshank have some amount of engineering. Shawshank perhaps should have been higher, as I mentioned. The length, uh, Shawshank is a shorter movie, so I give it a higher score, whereas the others are, I've tried and arranged them in some order. Right? So importantly, what we're saying is that we can look up any movie and describe it using a few set of attributes. So I'll say that I'll be using R features, small r features to describe a movie. So therefore we have created a matrix H of size R cross M. Right? We had M movies, capital M movies. I've created R features for each movie. So I've created a matrix R cross M, which is trying to represent what a movie is. Right? So some of you keep, you, some of you may be wondering why are we not studying neural networks, why are we studying linear regression on and on and on and on. It's the whole of January is gone, a bit of February is gone, all of this is useless. We, we are here to learn neural networks. Like, you might be having second thoughts like this. But what you're currently seeing is in the neural network world, in the modern days, you will typically call it something known as an embedding. Now, have you heard of the term embedding? Does that sound more exciting than this R cross M matrix? but they're effectively the same thing, embedding, or how many of you have heard of the term representations? Representation learning. How many of you have heard of the word vectors? Vectors you've heard, but vector to represent certain quantities in the world, right? So at this point of time, for the machine, you are a vector. A vector means that you have a sequence of numbers assigned to you, right? Every person in this room is currently a vector to a machine, right? Each movie is a vector. Right? And they are dealing with these vector spaces. So we'll discuss more about representation learning when we come to neural networks, etc. But this is just to show that you are actually now using state-of-the-art work or state-of-the-art terms. Okay, each movie can be described with some R features. Can we describe each user also with R features? And what would that mean? Okay, excellent. So we have described how much of Bollywoodness is in each movie, how much of engineering and how much of length is in each movie. But in order to define a rating for a person, I also need to understand how much affinity or how much liking to they have towards Bollywoodness, engineering or length, right? So therefore, for each user also, I'll have to describe these R attributes, 
which we'll take a look now. So let's see user one. Their Bollywoodness affinity towards Bollywoodness is 4.0. Engineering is 0.7 and length is 0.7, which means that they highly prefer Bollywood movies. Engineering and length they are okay with. Right? So now this is showing that each user is R dimensional vector. Previously I showed that each movie is R dimensional vector. So we can now create a matrix W. Previously I had created a matrix H of R cross M. Now I created a matrix W of size number of users cross R features. Right? So number of users as the rows, R features as the columns. Now we know that user 1 has rated Shole 5. We will now Okay, good. So, what's your name? Anirudh. Anirudh asked this good question that, how have you made up these numbers? Any guesses on this? I have made this up just for illustration purposes, so that I can show you that this method works. But in general, this will be the goal that we need to learn these numbers. The representation needs to be learned from data. We'll see in five minutes how that happens. Last row, no laptops, please. Okay, user one has rated Shole 5. So first we'll be looking at whether a framework sounds reasonable or not, and then we'll show or learn this, this framework or these matrices. Right, so user one has rated Shole 5. Let's now get the two matrices, the user, the movie, the user matrix and the movie matrix. The user matrix has for each user, you have entries, R dimensional entries, and movie matrix for each movie, you have the R dimensional matrix entry. Okay, so user one has affinity of 4.0 towards Bollywoodness, and Shole has a Bollywoodness of 1.2. User two, user one has an engineering affinity of 0.7, and the movie Shole has an engineering element of 0.1. Similarly. User 1 has an, has an affinity of 0.7 towards length and Shole is a very, very long movie, so the length score is 0.1, right? You have a R-dimensional vector for U1 and you have a R-dimensional vector for Shole. Now you need to use these two dimensional, two R-dimensional vectors to create the rating. How would we do that? Dot product of two R-dimensional vectors, which is also what we had specifically created. So. <clears throat> User 1 likes has affinity 4.0 and the actual presence of Bollywoodness is 1.2. So therefore, the overall rating which we predict for this user is 4 into 1.2 plus 0.7 into 0.1 plus 0.7 into 0.1, which turns out to be approximately 5. Right? So for this specific case, it seems that this user matrix and the movie matrix for Shole and user 1 seems like a good estimate. Right? Does everyone follow this? We can multiply these two vectors or we can do the dot product of these two vectors and we'd obtain the predicted rating for the movie Shole. Questions on this? What will happen in the extreme cases like user 1 has zero interest in Bollywood engineering or depth or has put a big amount of interest in it? Okay. So, Priyanka. Priyanchi. Okay, Priyanchi's question is that what happens in extreme cases? In this case, there is a Bollywoodness engineering length and the affinities are all between 0 0.7 and 0 0.4. What happens if someone has an extreme affinity towards, let's say, just Christopher Nolan movies and they don't like anything else, right? So what happens in those cases? So in those cases, the feature vector would be learned in that specific way. <coughs> More on this when we look at the actual data and we run through the examples and hopefully we'll find out certain, some characteristics. <clears throat> the important thing to note here is that these are just features that I have made up currently. Like your data does not necessarily encode these things. Like it would take a domain expert to figure out these features, which we don't have, and it will be extremely hard to figure out the user's preferences for each of them. Like you can ask the users, but the users will not be able to give you a good reading. 
So therefore, in order to predict or predict the ratings for a particular movie, we use a technique known as matrix factorization. Now you have already probably studied a bunch of factorization techniques. One of them is SVD, singular value decomposition. Does anyone know any other techniques? Any other technique? Edu decomposition, good. So maths folks should be able to come up with this quicker. This is their bread and butter. Okay, Priyanchi. QR. QR, any other? I can decomposition, similar to SVD, of course. Right? So we have studied all of these decompositions. Today we'll be looking at another very simple decomposition, which does not necessarily enforce a lot of the constraints like SVD or some of the other, like QR, etc. Some of them say that one particular matrix has to have a certain norm or some of the vectors have to be uh, in particular order. So here we're just saying that we have this matrix A, N users, M movies. We will try and decompose this as a matrix W, N cross R, times the movie H, R cross M. <clears throat> Here R is much, much lesser than N and M, and R is the rank of these matrix. Right? So what we're trying to say is that we are trying to learn a low rank decomposition of the original matrix A. Now what is the physical significance of this? When we can learn a low rank decomposition of any matrix, what does that mean? So we're not necessarily going into upper triangular and lower triangular. That's where we have different constrained forms of decompositions. We are looking at a simple form. You have you have linear independence. You can talk in terms of maths. But what I was hoping was that the ratings of a particular user and a movie can be described using a small number of factors. Right? That is what this low rank decomposition means. That instead of requiring instead of you knowing about n, so in, there is some structure which is present in the data. And that structure can be encoded using some r features. In the previous examples, we took some three features. But I just hand curated them. But you can also try and learn that from the data itself. Right? So each of these terms has some significance. Low rank decomposition because r is much, much smaller than n and m. And the other way to interpret this is the entirety of this matrix A can be largely represented using some R, very small number of features R. You don't need to have N or M number of independent features to describe this. Okay. Questions on this? Could I go over the? Okay. So the goal is somehow to estimate the ratings at places where we don't have ratings. Right? What we're saying is that we have ratings at a bunch of places, but missing at a few places. So therefore, we somehow need to complete this matrix A. Right? So the problem, overall problem is called matrix completion, but we can also do matrix completion via matrix decomposition. Right? So we decompose the matrix A as a product of two low rank matrices, W n cross R and H R cross M, where the W matrix is incorporating the R dimensional vector for each user and the H matrix is encoding the R dimensional vector, uh, vector for each movie. Once we do that, and if we multiply these two, we should be approximately able to get something close to A. Other, is that clear? Okay. Other questions? So this is where we now introduce optimization. We say that given A, a matrix A, we want to learn W and H such that A is approximately equal to W H or we want to learn W star and H star such that we are minimizing the square of the Frobenius norm of A minus W H. How many of us have heard about Frobenius norm? No, no one has heard Frobenius. Okay. Only one person. So sounds like a complicated name, right? Frobenius norm. Okay, let's go over it and see if you already know this, but you just don't know the term. Okay, what have I written here on the slide? No, this is not the L2 norm. Square of the L2 norm, right? 
Sometimes people get confused between the upper and the, the, super, uh, the superscript and the subscript. So y is firstly a vector. <clears throat> I have written this, this symbol. So typically we use the following notation. The superscript is telling the square. The subscript here is telling the specific norm, in this case the L2 norm. The, these, these vertical lines, they typically represent the norm. You can have L1 norm or L2 norm of a particular vector, in this case the vector is y. So the L2 norm squared would be 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square plus 4 square. If I didn't add the square, the answer would be the square root of this number. So on similar lines, now if you have a matrix A, so the, the Frobenius norm is defined for matrices, whereas the L1, L2 norms we were looking at was defined for vectors. So F means the Frobenius norm. This is basically the sum of squared of all the entries in the matrix. That's it. So you can also define this in terms of the L2 norm for the vectors, for the row vectors or the column vectors. You could define it that way. But that's it, right? So pretty similar in meaning. So another way which typically we'll see in practice this being done is we can flatten out the entire matrix. So we have a three rows, four columns. We have 12 entries. We can flatten this out to a 12-dimensional vector. And on that 12-dimensional vector, we can compute the L2 norm. That would be the same as this number, or square of the L2 norm. <coughs> OK. So now we come to the main goal, that we start with the optimization procedure. And this is a question I want to put to you. You need to, you can discuss with the neighbors. How do I learn W and H here? This is an optimization problem that I've given you. I need to learn W and H. So think, talk to your neighbors, come up with an answer. And remember how you previously solved certain kinds of optimization problems. Okay, who has the answers? How do you learn W and H? Okay. So Kush says that we have a loss function, which is A minus W H. A minus WH will firstly be a vector or a matrix? Matrix. A is a matrix, WH is a matrix. If you subtract two matrices, you'll get a matrix. <coughs> you can calculate the Frobenius norm of a matrix. You can square it. So what we're saying is that let's use this as a loss function and then use gradient descent to figure out W and H. It's quite simple. So you initialize W and H as some random matrix, N cross R matrix and R cross N matrix. And for the number of iterations, you can update W to be W minus some learning rate times the gradient with respect to W of the loss, of the gradient of the loss with respect to W, right? I'll not go into the specifics of how you're calculating the gradient with respect to, or the derivative of the gradient with respect to matrix, right? I'll not go into the specifics of that. For now, let's assume that the libraries that we're using will be able to do this. In the future, we'll be able to see how this happens. So aside from that technical challenge, does everyone see that we should be able to use gradient descent for this problem? Right. It's an optimization problem. We can use gradient descent for optimization problem. There are no constraints as of yet. So therefore, we can just use gradient descent in the vanilla form. And you can just initialize WNS to be some value. 
Any questions on this? What would be a fair initialization? So there is a lot of research on initializations for neural networks like things. So it's pretty much similar to how you would initialize neural networks. Typically, you just use a normal distribution and initialize these. So each of the entry in the W and the H matrix is coming from a normal 0, 1 distribution. Okay, other questions? Okay. So then let's look at a second method. I'll warn that I've asked the second method in the previous quizzes. So one thing that I was a little disappointed in this quiz was that I explicitly told in the lecture that I will ask the question on what is the number of non-repeated samples in a bootstrap. And not a lot of you have solved this correctly. It's so if I ask something explicitly and tell it will come in the quiz, please prepare at least those questions. So this question I have asked in previous quizzes also, which is the second method of solving matrix factorization. So it's something known as alternating least squares, which now follows very close to what we have learnt in linear regression. We initialize the W matrix as before with some n cross r randomly initialized entries. Then we alternatively learn W and H. So first, fix W, learn H via something known as least squares. We'll see least squares, we've already seen it, but not explicitly as the term least squares. Then you fix H and learn W via least squares. Right. This might be seeming a little complicated. Let's go over this step by step. Importantly, start with W, initialize W, learn H and then use that H and learn W. The difference between the gradient descent and alternative least square is that in gradient descent, you are parallelly updating W and H via a loss function. Here also the loss is the same only, but you're not making parallel updates, you're making sequential updates to W and H. You fix one, learn the other, you fix the other, learn this one. Okay. So I will be only giving an introduction to alternating least squares. I will give the rest as a part of the assignment or as a part of the quiz. We have a matrix A, which is N cross M. We have a matrix W, N cross R, and a matrix H, R cross M. Our goal is to learn both W and H. So if we remember what we did in linear regression, we had a very, very similar setup. In linear regression, we were trying to use the ground truth prediction vector y, which is n cross 1. Currently, our a is n cross m. y was n cross 1. We say that y can be approximated with x theta. Right? Does everyone remember that? y can be approximated as x theta. x was a n cross d dimensional matrix, and theta was a d cross 1 dimensional vector. Right? So what we said here was that you can learn theta hat as the least square of x comma y. So I'm going to use this notation of theta hat equal to least square of x comma y, where the final solution is x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, and so on and so forth. But effectively, whenever we are given y equal to y approximate x theta kind of problem, we can say that theta hat is least square of x comma y. Now think for a minute and tell me how would you learn h this way. So I want you now estimate H as some least square combination of A and H, A and W. So again, discuss with the neighbors and write the expression in your notebooks. You have to write H hat in terms of some least squares of some form of A and some form of W. So at this stage, you don't need to think much, just do the pattern matching.
hint is that if you cannot solve the whole problem, solve it for a simpler problem. And then if you want, you can write a for loop. So hint is to use a for loop to simplify your answers. Okay, who has an answer? One, two, three. Okay. Okay, what's your answer? You'll have to be louder. So we have a for loop from 1 to m, and then initialize each column of a as a least square of w and uh, m as column of a. Okay, good. What's your name? Sevanch. Sevanch, good. So now, whenever we look at such problems, I request to go slow and just draw the parallels to an easier already solved problem. The earlier easily solved problem is linear regression. Now, can you look at the fact that if you just pick up one column of A, the first column of A, that is similar to just learning, that is similar in, uh, in meaning to Y. W was a matrix n cross R, W is a X is a matrix n cross D, so that is similar. And theta was a D cross 1 vector, so we can similarly pick the first column of H, which is R cross 1 vector. So now knowing this, can all of you take 30 more seconds and write down H of something, something equal to D square of something and something. Can you write that now, looking at this? You can use the NumPy notation to order to refer to certain rows and columns or the math notation, whichever one you want. Okay, who's been able to write now? Answer now. Okay, let's go over the answer. How would you refer to the first column of A in NumPy like notation? You need to consider all the rows and the zeroth column. So it's A of colon comma zero, all the rows means you consider everything and comma zero means you're looking at the first column. Similarly, W you consider fully and H hat of all the rows in the first column is least square of W comma the first column of A, right? The first column of H you can estimate to be as the least square of W comma the first column of A, which is now exactly identical to what you had in the linear regression like problem. So now you can write a simple for loop around this or you can do something more sophisticated around this. This is to learn H given W. The next question is to learn W given H, which I won't give you the answer. You have to prepare for that. 
either in the assignment or in the quiz or in both or in none but do prepare that okay so now we'll go on and do some practical any any question in this So let's go and do some practical now. So now we'll make some prediction for certain users in the movie recommendation space. I downloaded this file. I am doing some simple pre-processing, like dropping the timestamp, because I didn't want to know, I already don't want to show that many of you were filling in this form during your lecture hours. So I don't want to show that. Let's just drop the timestamp, set the index to your names. So I have 114 rows and 10 columns. And wherever I didn't have an entry, I have a NANS. Right. So the initial few users had watched most of the movies, so you won't be able to predict anything for them. And this is just showing me the list of 114 names. I picked up the TA just to show, just as a guinea pig. So Ayush is the TA. I can look at Ayush's ratings for each of the movie. Surprisingly, he didn't like Dangal, which is, so, so the most watched movie amongst these folks, amongst the folks that I've seen, uh, uh, survey was Dangal, and it was one of the more highly rated amongst you 114 people. But, he doesn't like it. And Nottingill, most of the people give, give slightly lower ratings compared to the others. So if we look at the number of missing entries, so only one person has not watched Dangal and one person has not watched Star as Ameenpur. Everyone else has watched. And Nottingill is the one which fewest people have watched. So these kind of summary statistics are always useful to get a sense of the problem you're trying to solve. So therefore, if you have to predict some ratings for a movie which has not been watched by a lot of people, it may be slightly harder. So before I go on and show this problem of recommending the ratings, I'll first show simple matrix factorization. I'll be using gradient descent here. So I have created a random matrix of 20, 10 with numbers between 1 and 5. So this is just to mimic the setup. And this matrix is 20 cross 10. I want to decompose it into WH, where H is n cross K and H, W is n cross K and H is K cross N. Previously I was using R, but here I'm using K. So I will firstly just randomly initialize W to be n comma R, okay, R here, I'm again back to R. And H to be randomly initialized matrix of R comma N size. Here I'm just specifically setting the device just to make the computation quicker and I'm requiring setting the grad equal to true because I want gradient descent to work. If I just show you the loss on an uninitialized, on, on randomly initialized data set, my loss is 53.8, right? So this is the loss, which is the Frobenius norm or the square of the Frobenius norm of A minus W into H, right? So matrix multiply, WH minus A or A minus WH shouldn't matter because we're considering the square of it. And I can then matrix multiply WH to show you the learned matrix. So this is my A hat. This is my estimated A if I multiply W and H. And here I've randomly initialized entries. So therefore, many of the entries can also be negative. Right. Over time, we'll see that the entries should all be roughly in the range of 1 to 5. Whereas this was a true matrix. So if we look at the first, let me just look at the first few entries to make it easy to compare. Like the first entry for the first user is 0. Point, predicted as 0. 0.979, 0. 0.27, etc. So they're very, very far. That is why the loss is high. And here I'm showing the basic optimization. Here I'm using uh, TOTS inbuilt optimization modules. So the main thing is to initialize an optimizer. We have thus far looked at the SGD, so you can just replace this with SGD. You need to give the set of parameters which you will be updating over. 
computing the loss over, so which will go as an input to the loss function and which you want to update. I have set the learning rate to be 0 0.01 and this is gradient descent like or optimization in process. You compute the loss which is the Frobenius norm of A minus WH or WH minus A. There are certain nuances to certain specific things we need to do is to zero out the gradient and call dot backward which then fills in the gradient values and optimizer dot step would do something like w equal to w minus alpha times the gradient of the loss with respect to w and update it. And then every few entries I am just printing out the losses. Because I am running this on the GPU this was fairly quick. The loss goes down from 53.8 to 13.5. Right? And now if I look at the entries, they are okayish. They are not very good. One of the reasons they are not very good is because the data set itself was very random. Right? But still I am able to learn some structure through it. Like you can see that this was the predicted as 4.16, the ground truth is 4, the predicted as 1.7, the ground truth is 3, predicted as 2, the ground truth is 1, so on and so forth. They are not too bad. So then I was just writing a general routine around this to make it easier to do some experiments. And what do you expect the loss trend to be as I increase k or r? So I am factorizing a as w as n cross r and r cross m. If I increase r, what do you expect the loss to be? Decrease. Because now I am considering more factors, I am giving the model more freedom, more complexity to try and reconstruct. And that is what I do. So you can notice that for increasing k, the reconstruction loss, this is also known as the reconstruction loss, the loss uh, when you reconstruct the matrix is going down, right? which is expected because now model now has more flexibility, more features, more structure to, to try and decompose the original matrix. And now with this particular rank of 9, if I show you the first two ratings for the first two user, can you see that the reconstruction is now very good? Ground truth 1 predicted 1.01, ground truth 4 predicted 4.02, ground truth 5 predicted 4.9, ground truth 3 predicted 2.9 and so on and so forth. Right? Using a lesser number of features, I have been able to decompose the original matrix into two sum matrices. In this case, I have taken it to the extreme, but in general with a small number of factors, you should be able to do this. But our problem was not to work with complete data. Right? If we had complete data, there is no need of doing matrix factorization. So rather we want to look at the cases where we have missing values. So this is that case. I randomly put some values to be NANs, not a number, unknown values or missing entries. Now if I repeat the same procedure as before, call WH loss equal to factorize of A comma 2 and set the device. What do I get? I don't get an error. I get that the loss is NAN. What does NAN stand for? Not a number. The loss is not a number. So what do I do now? Like is the whole lecture use useless? I showed you a lot of dreams that we can factorize. I can show you, predict the movie ratings for unknown cases, but my function has just failed. What should we do? Decrease the? Replace NAN by a number. Okay, replace. Priyanshi says that replace NAN with a zero, which is typically what a lot of people do. What is the problem in that? Zero has a meaning that it's very low rank, uh, low. You have given it a very low rating. What else could you do? Okay. Okay. He says uniformly choose. Okay. The so Kishan says a very nice answer that ignore the values where you have a NAN while computing the loss. Right. So we will see that 
we first create a mask to check where the values are not NANs. Right. So I'll have to If you look at A, the first row and first column is not a NAN. The second row, the first row and second column is a NAN, right? So not NAN, NAN, not NAN, not NAN, not NAN, right? Correspondingly, I've created a mask, true, false, true, true. So I get true wherever I have an entry. I get a false wherever I don't have an entry, right? So basically, this is telling me it's a binary index of what values I should be considering in my loss. Wherever I have a false, I will not be using my this particular term in my loss calculation. Right? If I do mass.sum, it comes out to be about 93. Does anyone have any guesses of why this number is close to 93? So we had total of 200 entries and if I create a mask this particular way, I get the number of non-zero entries to be 93. Why? No, so here I am showing you on a dummy data. What does torch.ran do? There's an equivalent in numpy also. numpy.random.rant. What does it do? It uses the random space of No, that is rand n. Random normal. If it is just rand, it is from the uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Right? So again, a homework exercise for you which is a good candidate for an upcoming quiz question that why if I give torch or trend on a dot shape less than 0.5 and set it to nan, I get about half of the entries which is the same as 0.5 as non-zero, right? So you already have all the maths to do this. You have already studied the uniform distribution, you know the PDF of the uniform distribution, you know the CDF of the normal of the uniform distribution, you know all of the values. All of those things. Okay, so then I need to modify it in a way that I don't look at the entries where I have a false, right? So I said that this particular mask I will be using for binary indexing. I had this matrix WH. I calculated the difference matrix, which is WH minus A. And if I look at the difference matrix shape, or if I look at the different matrix, right, it contains NANs, right, which is obvious. So difference matrix at NANs at all those positions at which A had a NAN. Because W and H both don't have NANs. So W into H also doesn't produce any NANs. So therefore, difference matrix has NANs wherever A had a NAN. And if I do difference matrix of mask dot shape, so I binary index uh, using the mask, I get 91 entries, in this case now 93 entries, right? Now difference, difference matrix of mask, is it a matrix or is it a vector? Difference matrix was of shape 20 comma 10, right? Now if I binary index using a matrix mask, I get the shape as 93. Is this a vector or is this a matrix? It's a vector, right? Matrix would have been 93 commas, A comma B kind of setup. So therefore, I'll have to apply the mask also in, on my W into H, or in this case, actually not, because I've directly done in the difference matrix. Right? So therefore, I just make a very small modification. I compute the mask. By looking at the non-zero entries, I get a binary matrix. I compute the difference matrix, which is WH minus A. I create the difference vector, which is the difference matrix binary indexed by the mask. 
and I create, calculate the norm of this vector. Now. Previously, I was looking at the Frobenius norm of the matrix, but now since I've converted from a matrix to a vector, and I've shown the relationship between the matrix and the vector, the Frobenius and the L2 norm, I can directly just look at the L2 norm of this vector. Everything else remains the same. So if I now run through this, you can see that I can get a loss even after the fact that A has uh, missing entries. And I can do matrix multiplication of W into H. Now I will try and repeat the same procedure for movie recommendation. I start with my data frame which was n users, m movies, 114 users, 10 movies. I create the matrix, 114, 10 matrix here. I decompose it as a rank 5 decomposition. And now comes the fun part where I want to predict ratings. First, I'll predict ratings for Ayush, who is a TA. So can you notice that our ratings, predicted ratings are fairly accurate. He has watched all the movies. So Shole, we are predicting 4.8. So this we are predicting 4.1. Dangal, we are predicting 3.3. .3. So maybe the system thinks that he should have rated us slightly higher, right? And all of the other ratings are quite well matching, right? So 114, 10 matrix, you have decomposed it at 114, 5 and a 5, 10 matrix. And that is giving you a fairly good reconstruction. Now we'll predict for anyone. Okay, who wants to volunteer to tell what movies to recommend to them? So at least for this, you should be a little, okay, let's see Kush. So I've created this widget. I think such widgets are cool to sh create such demos. I hope it allows me to, yes, it allows me. So Kush has not watched Shole, The Matrix, Interstellar, Notting Hill, and Uri. So something you might be noticing is that some ratings are between are beyond five, right? So I have not done anything specific to limit my ratings from a one to five scale or zero to five scale. What can we do? Sorry? You can normalize the ratings. At what time? At the time of training or the time of testing? So because the training set or the set which I use for factorization, not exactly training set, my input matrix A did not have any rating beyond 5, right? But I'm still getting ratings beyond 5. So I had to do something very specific to ensure that my ratings are between 0 and 5. What do I do? Okay. Okay. So Jadev gives a very crude answer that if it's below zero, you give it to zero. You hard threshold. Above five, you threshold it to five. You can do that. It's an okayish way to do. Think of a better way. So between zero and one, we won't necessarily call that normalization. You are doing you're limiting the scale to zero one. How do you do, how do you limit something between 0 and 1? Okay, so quiz question, hint is sigmoid. We'll study a particular function known as sigmoid, which will force the values to be between 0 and 1. If you have certain values between 0 and 1, you can rescale them to between something between 0 and 5. <coughs> okay. Okay, so Deep's question is that if you use the sigmoid function on the predicted, you'll get a value between 0 and 1. So I'm saying that you don't stop at 0 to 1, but you rescale that to 0 to 5. So 0 to 1 is an easy scale to work with, you can get that with sigmoid. And then any number between 0 and 1, you can use a very simple function transformation to get that to be a number between 0 and 5. So that is what you have to do. And then finally, your prediction is always between 0 and 5, your ground truth is also between 0 and 5. You're working from the 0 to 5 scale. 
you ground truth is between 0 and 5, but you predicted is not between 0 and 5. So you first scale it to between 0 to 1. I mean, you not scale it, you, you make the prediction between 0 to 1 using a sigmoid and then another transform to get it between 0 to 5. Or you can have a single transform which takes any number from minus infinity to infinity and brings it to the range from 0 to 5. That is what you need to do. So it seems that Kush should definitely watch the matrix and interstellar because there seems to be some, uh, some element of sci-fi that he likes, like the dark knight he likes. So he probably should watch. Shole he should maybe watch, not watch. Right. Okay, who else is wants to check? No one wants to watch movies. Okay. Okay, your name? Aryan. Aryan Gupta. Which one? Okay. So let's look at his ratings. So he probably does not like the matrix, but because of peer pressure, he says that he likes matrix, and that's why he's given four. At least that's what the system thinks. Because the other movies are reasonably accurate, it's the matrix which is mostly off. And the Dark Knight, he says, I so think again, he probably doesn't like these movies that much, but you lose friends if you say that you don't like these movies. <laughs> Who else wants to test? We have no data for a user Okay, Kishan is asking a good question. If we don't have a user's data, any movie a user has not rated, can we predict for that particular user or not? Okay, so Deep says that we can perhaps have some user curated or some uh, specifications you ask from them and create something. But using this plain matrix factorization, you will get garbage. Why? Because if a person has all NAT, right? So we are not using any data from that user to, to update the user's vector. So the movie vector exists, but the user vector will not exist. It will be a randomly initialized one. Right? It is not getting updated for that particular user. So you'll have to actually think about this right in your notebook and you'll come to the conclusion that the users, this specific user's vector is not getting updated because none of the rating is taken into consideration while computing the loss. So the movie rating exists, but we don't know how much a user likes a particular attribute R. So these problems are typically known as cold start problem. Right? In winters, many times not here, but in north part of India, cars don't start in the winters. It's cold start problem. Similarly, if you don't have enough or zero, close to zero ratings, you'll not be able to make a prediction. Okay. Other questions? Sir, so, the, so there is no rating for that particular uh, user. Right? You have, that user has not rated anything, which means that that particular uh, user's record are not being used in the loss, which means that the user's vector which is R dimensional vector is not being learned. It was initialized. It is an initial random value. You have not been able to update it why a grade it isn't. Anyone else wants to test? Okay. Now let's move on to the next thing. I have this dog image. I will crop this. By the way, some of these questions which we are discussing, we will ask them in the assignment. Like, we, you'll start off with these notebooks and you'll have to complete the assignment. You start off with this dog notebook, dog image, you crop it to something like this over this region. And I will now mask some of the entries, which is randomly remove some of the entries. I'll not, there are different kinds of errors you can introduce on in images, some of them being you put a Gaussian blur, etc. For now, I'll just mask out some entries. And this is what I'd showed you initially, right? So now the image which I'm seeing is something like this. Now I'll use this masked image itself and I'll do matrix factorization over this and then I'll do matrix completion. So I use 50 factors. It's a 300 cross 300 image. I use 50 factors. 
my loss is some 1, 3, 2, 3. And if I make a prediction, so I'm able to reconstruct this image using this noise, seemingly noise, right? What does this tell you? This is one of the reasons why matrix factorization is working. So even though you've removed a lot of the pixels, there is some structure which is left. And because you've randomly removed some pixels, that structure is, you can still interpret that structure using a low rank decomposition. Using only a small number of factors, you're able to reconstruct this. Which seems magical at first, like how can you go from something like this to this, right? But because you have randomly removed these things, it's a simple problem. In the assignment, I'll ask you this question that instead of randomly removing, I'd remove an entire square or a rectangle patch. And that you have to fill. And you have to argue whether why that's a simpler or a harder problem. Your result should show you that what kind of a problem it is. So then I have just modified this so that we can go, we can set the proportion Now, can you see that this seems like an impossible task? But this is working. You are move, going from these set of dots to this image. Right? Seems almost impossible, but it works. But if you had a much lesser number of factors, of course, this will be poorer. But still, you can still get some structure. If you had a large number of factors, it may not improve a lot. Oh, this is taking a bit of time to run. But if you had not a lot of missing data, if you had 50% missing data, your reconstruction is fairly good. Now, what I was mentioning, but I have not shown yet, and I will not go into the details of this, perhaps we will revisit this when we have studied neural networks, is that we can create the same thing using neural networks, like neural network libraries for that. So I had created this matrix of n users r factors and another matrix for n movies r factors of r cross m. So in the neural network world or the neural network library world, these things are known as embeddings or representations or vectors or any of them you can call. So you have an embedding which is, you can think of the embedding to be a lookup table. You have looked at lookup table in various courses. So given a user, can you tell me its vector? Given a movie, can you tell me its vector? That is all we can, we have to say here. And you can get the same results following this strategy also. Okay, questions? Okay, so I still have a couple of minutes, so I'll show you something else. You'll keep seeing this dog various times in my notebooks. So this is the other question which we'll ask in the assignment. So here I am learning a linear regression model which goes from the pixel location. The pixel location in this image is x comma y, right? So your input dimension is two. From that, you want to predict RGB values, three values. So from pixel XY to RGB, you want to predict those values. I create this entire matrix X. So this is again a 300 comma 300 image. If I just stack up the XY pairs, I'll get nine, 900,000 comma two, sorry, 90,000 comma two as my input F features X. So this is like X zero, x0, y0, x0, y1, x0, y2, so on and so forth, and x300, y300. So we get 90,000 such uh, pairs of size 2, and my output is 90,000, 3. Right? So I want to learn a linear regression model which takes 90,000, 2, 90,000 samples of two dimensions to produce 90,000, 3. Right? So you can, use multi you can also get multiple outputs via linear regression. It need not be a single dimensional vector. I am showing all of this in this notebook. 
I am then also showing the reconstructions. So if I then use the same learned linear regression model and give it all of the inputs from 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2 till 300, 300, this is the reconstruction I, which I get, which is very, very poor. Right? I'm not able to reconstruct the training image. But then we learned that there is something known as basis functions. Right? If I, instead of just using linear features, the input features, I can now use polynomial features. I start getting something better. So here I'm using polynomial features, pre-processing the polynomial features of certain degree. And then I use random Fourier features, which I'd shown, which is sines and cosines of varying frequencies. So I have specifically now created additional 37,000 features of various frequencies of sines and cosines using the input features. And this is my reconstruction. Right? So it might seem surprising to you, it might seem boring to you, but what we have done using simple linear regression plus polynomial basis slash random Fourier features. This is close to or perhaps beating the state of the art, which is using very sophisticated neural networks. Right? If you don't believe, let me show you this. Okay, so can you see that this is the ground truth image? This is the reconstruction you're getting using a regular neural network with something known as the ReLU activation, which is typically being used. Can you see it's very hazy, right? With using their method, which is known as SIRE, you know, very sophisticated method, actually not very sophisticated, but something specific, they're able to get a very, very good reconstruction, right? You're able to match this, this entire paper. I think it's a NeurIPS or an ICML paper. I don't know where this is, either Neurex or ICML, by a linear regression, right? The important change that you've done to linear regression is random Fourier features. You have created those extra features, which give the model the expressive power, right? So never discount linear regression. You can get a lot of leverage just using linear regression. Okay, so we'll stop here. We'll meet on Friday. So Friday's class we keep exactly at 11.30, not a minute late. Right, there's no excuse for being late on Friday. We close the door at 11.30. On Mondays and Wednesdays, 8.35. We close the door.